either remain seated or, if you wish, use the kneelers that are in front of your pew. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me. Because you formed us from dust. Because you declared us created in your image. We have prepared a cross for our Savior.
Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, Jesus did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But Jesus gave Pilate no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner from the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For Pilate realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man for today. I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And he said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Crucify him. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. So Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's quarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him, and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. And they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Sarim named Simon. They compelled him, this man, to carry the cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when Jesus tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by mocked him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's Son. From noon on, 
Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama semabakhi, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus, felt the earth shake, and saw all that took place. They were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb.
when I was a university student. I began attending this church, All Saints Church, in the mornings. And in due time, I had decided to be confirmed in the Anglican Church of Canada. That was the winter of, oh, 1981. And then that Good Friday, just a month or two later, the rector of All Saints preached a sermon that has been forever imprinted on my imagination. He took the role of a centurion he called Marcellus and retold the story. And all these years later, I am grateful to James Setter, may he rest in peace, for having done that and inspiring my own understanding of how Good Friday might be approached. I am Marcellus, centurion in the army of the Emperor Tiberius, assigned to the province of Judea under the authority of Pontius Pilate. Today I have witnessed a crucifixion like no other. The man was a Galilean named Jesus, and his dying is etched upon my eyes. To any of the soldiers under my command, the day may have at first looked like any other. There were rebels to be executed, and while for most of my men that was simply a matter of duty, for too many of them it meant barbarous amusement. One had to let it all happen to keep those soldiers from grumbling too much. Though I have never had any appetite for taking delight in torture, best to let the locals give the condemned that mix of wine and gall to lessen the pain and hope that they would all eventually learn that political action always landed a rebel on a cross. Best to have the condemned die quickly on their crosses, but too often it lasted into the night, right through the next morning. I am not a soft man, but such a death, while necessary, is nothing to relish. Those who actually enjoyed it tended to be the least stable soldiers under my command. This day had been particularly harsh. Four were to be executed. Three Jewish rebels, including a particularly troublesome one named Barabbas, and this teacher, this reputed healer, Jesus, condemned for evidently making claims for himself that he was the king of the Judeans. Oddly. This charge was brought against him by the Jewish high priest Caiaphas, a man for whom the governor Pilate generally had little time, little patience. It was, from the beginning, all very strange. I'd heard of this Jesus earlier in the week, when he caused some uprising at their vaunted temple by tipping over tables and chasing out the merchants who sold doves there for their sacrificial rites. Over the course of the next few days, there was talk amongst my soldiers about how this Galilean was seen in the market square or right outside of the temple itself, debating with some of their prominent leaders and apparently alienating those with power, all the while endearing the common folk to him because of his debate victories over their more educated members. There was even talk of how one day they had tried to corner him with a question about whether it was right for a Judean to pay taxes to Caesar, as if there was any choice. And he came right back at them with a clever ploy through which he managed to both support taxation to Caesar and hold on to his primary loyalty to his God. But from all that I heard, there was nothing criminal, certainly nothing worth taking before Pilate. 
It sounded more that some of those leaders simply found him infuriating. For their own strange reasons, they wanted Pilate to do away with him. Now, Pilate was never one to do anything he didn't want to do. And if he wanted to execute a suspected rebel by crucifixion, he would have done it without giving a second thought. If anything, Pilate was too harsh, even by Roman imperial standards. He was even called upon by the emperor to answer for some of his behavior toward these locals. But that largely hadn't mattered to him. When he had used their temple treasury to finance a new aqueduct into Jerusalem, something they desperately needed to improve the quality of their water supply, rebels rose up in protest, but he put that down by sending in soldiers with clubs and horses, killing as many of the rebels as they could. That happened before I was assigned to this wretched place. But my soldiers were only too happy to tell me about it. That was the Pontius Pilate we all knew. Cold, decisive, unafraid of violence, and so very, very sure of himself. So why did this Galilean confound him? My men took custody of Jesus at the entrance to Pilate's headquarters when their temple police brought him to us, demanding he be brought before the governor on this charge of sedition. He'd been beaten, badly beaten. But those chief priests didn't so much as flinch as they handed him over to my men. Their jaws were set. Their minds evidently made up as to what they wanted from Pilate. So they walked behind us as we marched him in to stand before the governor. Pilate heard their claims about his alleged crime. So he turned to the Galilean and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? There was a brief pause, and then without any expression, Jesus answered, You say so. I think it was his calmness that caused an explosion of accusations from those, those priests and elders, fingers pointing, words flying. But to, to these, the Galilean said, nothing. Pilate waved off their shouting and gesturing, and I had the soldiers step forward to face them. The room fell silent. And Pilate looked at him and asked, do you hear how many accusations they make against you? No answer. Not a word. Not even anything from his eyes. Silent. Pilate shook his head. Then he looked at those priests with utter disdain. I've seen the man scornful before. But this was a look that cut right to the bone. And I saw that look come into his eyes that suggested he determined then a rather unexpected resolution to this matter, one that would leave their priests and elders humiliated. Turning to me, he asked, of those to be executed today, is there one who might be particularly out of favor with these Judeans. There is one, sir, I replied, a man named Barabbas. He's a rebel, but he's also been a strong arm problem for his own people. Bring him, bind his hands, but don't let your soldiers bloody his face, he replied. So we did. I ordered my soldiers to be firm, tie the bonds tightly around his wrists, but not be so rough as to draw blood. Pilate had both Jesus and Barabbas escorted to the balcony overlooking the square, where a crowd had gathered waiting for Pilate's odd festival ritual of letting one prisoner go free. It was, under normal circumstances, a way to pacify any mob mentality. 
Strangely, it often turned the crowd against those who would still be crucified. Whom do you want me to release for you, he said, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called your Messiah? And the le then a letter was handed to him, which I understand came from his wife. He read the note and he looked pained. He paused breathed deeply, and repeated his call for a decision, saying, Which of the two do you want me to release? And that crowd thundered back, Barabbas. I glanced over to where the chief priest stood, and caught what seemed altogether satisfied looks on their faces. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He seemed strained, frustrated, and I wondered why he even offered them that question. He had the authority to free the man or send him to the cross, but this day he seemed strangely caught. Crucify him, the crowd roared. Why? What evil has he done? Crucify him. Pilate then performed an act that struck me as completely out of his normal character. He had a bowl of water brought to him. He washed his hands, held them up, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. With that, he released Barabbas and sent Jesus with the guards to be flogged and crucified. I have no wit, no words, no tears. The heart within me, like a stone, is numb too much. Hopes and fears, look left, look right, I dwell alone. I left my eyes, but filled with grief, no everlasting hills I see. My life is like a faded leaf, oh Jesus, quicken me, oh Jesus, quicken me. something of the rage of that crowd. 
I might have stopped them if I could, but it seemed useless to try. They stripped the man down, threw a scarlet robe across his shoulders, pressed a ring of thorns onto his head. One of them fetched a stick and forced it into his hand, and then they taunted that poor Galilean, spitting on him and mocking his claims to be a Jewish king. This little game done, they took back the scarlet robe, threw his own poor garment back across his shoulders, and led him to the place of crucifixion. I could see that he was exhausted by it all. It was all he could do to haul that cross along the road toward Golgotha. As he stumbled for a third time, two of my soldiers forced a man from the crowd to shoulder that cross for the final stretch of road to that hill outside the city gates. And then pushing that man away, they tore off the garment Jesus wore pressed his naked body onto the cross, nailed down his feet and wrists, and fixed a sign right above his head. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. That pitiable garment that he wore, blood-stained, dirt-encrusted, became the object of a little gambling game amongst some of my men. This was not unique to Jesus. It was something they generally did, though seldom for the value of the garment. It's winning the game that counts to them, a way of trying to get one up on the others, if only for a few hours. I don't know. Maybe it makes the executed person seem even less real as a human if they do that. But I've seen too many executions, and I suppose the older I get, the less patience I have for it all. It is a spectacle, no doubt, and one made to imprint itself on the minds of the crowd, saying, careful now about your politics if you want to avoid this. But in that moment, I wondered if it was all just a bloodlust spectacle a strange sort of entertainment on a bleak afternoon. Did anyone in that mob learn anything? I doubt it. Six hours it lasted, not long compared to what I've seen, but he'd already been so bloodied that it was remarkable he lasted that long. Some in the crowd taunted and mocked him, and remarkably those chief priests were there with their own vicious words. Had I ever seen the priests at a crucifixion? Don't believe I ever have. But there they were, confident that some strange justice was being done. Two odd events punctuated that death. After three hours, the sky seemed to darken. The power normally in the sun seemed muted. It remained that way for another three hours. And then suddenly he called out in a loud voice, with more strength and volume than I could have expected, something in their own strange tongue. This all seemed to stir up the crowd again. Some sort of argument arose amongst those closest to the cross. A sponge soaked in sour wine was put on a long stick, pressed up to his lips, but he refused it. And then he cried out again, took a deep breath. His whole body slumped down, dead. He was dead. Then the second strange event began. The ground began to tremble and shake, harder and harder, as if threatening to split open. And then it stopped. And I looked at his broken body on the cross, and these words just came from my mouth. I, I couldn't even stop them. 
Truly, this man was a son of God. The eyes of the soldiers standing with me were wide open, frightened eyes, terrified eyes. They looked at me with astonishment, and then they nodded. Yes, yes, he must have been that. He must have been from the gods. What have we done? I am Marcellus, centurion in the army of Emperor Tiberius, assigned to the province of Judea under the authority of Pontius Pilate. Today I have witnessed a crucifixion like no other. The man was a Galilean named Jesus, and his dying is etched upon my eye. Even 
from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near at hand, and there is none to know. Mighty oxen come around me. Strong bulls of Bashan close in on me from every side. They gape upon me with their mouths as it were ramping and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has become like wax, melting in the depths of my body. My mouth is dried up like a potshead. My tongue cleaves to my gums. And you have laid me in the dust of death. My people, what more could I have done for you, and did it not? Behold, I have planted you as my fairest vine. And we have come out of the very desert as you, for we have quenched your thirst to the and with the lands and the ears of our Savior's side. My people, what more could I have done for you? Did it not? Behold, I have planted you as my fairest vine. You gave us your peace, which the world cannot give, and you washed our feet as a sign of your love. You shared with us your body and blood, but we scattered and denied and abandoned you. My people, what more could I have done for you? Behold, did it not? Behold, I have planted you as my fairest vine. You grafted us onto the tree of the children of Israel, and we turned on them with persecution. You made us join heirs with them of your covenants, and we made them scapegoats for our own guilt. My people, what have I done unto you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me.
Mississippi. 